Welcome back to Turning Hard Times into Good Times. I'm your host, Jay Taylor, uh, and I'm really pleased to have with me once again John Kaiser. I just returned from a, a conference up in uh, Colorado, and uh, and somebody remarked that John Kaiser has some of the most interesting uh, ideas out there in the junior mining space, and I would have to agree with that. John does bring some very good ideas, and we want to explore some of those with him. And I think the idea here is that, you know, if, uh, if you can find some technology or something that gives you an edge in finding minerals or in producing something, then obviously uh, your, your profit margins or your potential upside uh, gains can be much larger than if you're just sort of sticking to the uh, to the regular technologies, the regular ways of doing things. So John is a very a very innovative thinker and uh, someone I've learned to know over the years as a speaker at various conferences. I have a very high respect uh, for John and his work uh, over the years. And so uh, welcome, John. It's really good to have you with me again. Jay, it's a pleasure to be back. You know, before we get going, I neglected to jot down your website so that people can follow up on your work and subscribe to your letter. Tell our listeners what that is. Your website, KaiserResearch.com, no hyphen, and okay. uh, we we have a uh, hundred dollar a month uh, subscription package, which you can try out and see uh, if all the various services that we offer are of use to you. And it, they're very unique services too, I, I must say. And I, uh, you know, was on John's website earlier today, and I noticed uh, the sort of the model that you are, the way that you have of sort of. Uh, conveying to your subscribers the intensity uh, of your likes or dislikes for different companies, and I think it's it's very uh, very unique. It's not like you know because you can say I recommend this 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 and this, but how how strongly do you feel about something? How strongly uh, how positive or how negative are things? And and I think you sort of convey that the intensity of your uh, bullishness or bearishness more than than most newsletters do. Uh, John, I want to get into some of the ideas that you have and some of the stocks that you have uh, recommended, but maybe before we do that, we can talk about some of the macro views. Uh, you're suggesting that uh, we're going to have the quantitative easing will come to an end. you really believe that's going to happen? Well, if you look at the way the American economy is plodding along, it shouldn't really end, but they have decided to do it, and I think it's necessary because... Uh, it's it's like an uh, uh, it's an artificial stimulus. It has, keeps the uh, market propped up. Uh, as long as the market's artificially propped up, businesses are going to sit on their cash and, and 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 just use whatever cash they have to buy back their own shares. There is no belief out there that America is back on an organic growth track. And until the patient comes off the IV, there is no chance for a real recovery. Um, I think there is a chance that we will go back on QE in 2015 when mm-hmm. we see how well the patient works without the IV. Mm-hmm. Okay, in other words, how well the patient doesn't work without the IV, you mean? That, that's right. <laughs> if, if he keels over, they're going to yeah. say, oh, Uh-oh. <laughs> we took him off you the drip s- medication too soon. Yeah. Yeah, you start hearing the uh, that uh, that sound going off that there's a coronary arrest or something, and all of a sudden, it's a code 14 or whatever they call it in various hospitals. Uh, all right, so you mentioned also. I mean, I, I think one of the probably the the issues that most Americans aren't very focused on, but one that could be uh, have earth shattering ramifications is the Scottish vote that's coming up. Uh, I guess this week, right? Yes, uh, Friday. Friday, I think, is the vote and. Uh and it's it's now a um, pretty close race as to what was assumed uh, a year ago to be just, okay, we'll let them go do that. Uh, now all of a sudden the yes side has a chance of winning, and I think this will destabilize uh, uh, Great Britain's role in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, I mean, there's. Uh, I saw some some statistics showing that the amount of oil that is uh, that is produced off the Scottish shores are, is very substantial. I don't know. I can't imagine that Britain would allow that to uh, to just give that up. So even if the if the race were to go in favor of the yes uh, for succession that um, uh, for seceding from Britain, that uh, the that the British would just you know would just take it. Would just allow that to happen. I mean, I can't imagine. I don't know the legal ramifications. I have you thought through this stuff at all? I mean, is it going? To, you you're saying that it could be very substantial in terms of uh, Britain's uh, economic well-being. Well, the, uh, the, the the Scots seem to have the the yes side seems to have the idea that they can uh, 
uh, take all the oil for themselves and stick uh, stick uh, England with uh, their pro rata share of the uh, accumulated debt. And that's mm. not how it's going to happen. Uh, yeah. This is going to be, if it comes to a yes, it will be a nasty divorce like all divorces end up. And there will be a period where everybody will be worse off. Uh, whether further down the road, Scotland flourishes as an independent country, uh, time, time will tell. Uh, the negative implication for England is that um, the group that wants to pull out of the Eurozone will... Uh, Will, will gain momentum too. And what we're seeing is potentially the uh, fragmentation of the whole Eurozone into a whole bunch of uh, individual countries, which, which may happen because Germany's obsession with austerity is preventing Europe from uh, gaining traction again. And so eventually it'll all split up and they'll all become a bunch of small com- 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 countries. Leaving the United States is really the biggest Western company left on the street. Yeah, interesting. Well, we'll we'll see how that happens. Uh, you also, uh, in some notes to me, that you sent your you're concerned uh, about the Russian sanctions and what that might mean for the uh, for the global economy. Talk to us a little bit about that. Well, I believe we are in a uh, a long term trend of reversing the globalization trend of the past couple decades. Uh, I see the emergence of China as a challenge to American uh, dominance. Uh, both militarily and economically, and all these sanctions being thrown around is a slippery path towards the end of free trade, of where where everybody invents some sort of reason not to sell goods or accept goods from other countries. And it'll be interesting because globalization is part of the problem we have right now, where we have jurisdictions such as China, where you are allowed to dump a uh, uh, pollution costs on the environment in a way that you're not in Europe and the United States, mm-hmm. where you have cheap labor that's willing to work for a lot less than elsewhere. And this has created an imbalance in, uh, in, in exports. So countries like China have a much better ability to export goods to higher cost jurisdictions like Europe and the United States. And that's part of the malaise over here because not everybody can become a software engineer or some other specialist. Uh, Ordinary people still need to do ordinary people in order to consume ordinary things. And I think this is the problem going forward is what are all these young people who aren't uh, the top 10% going to do to earn the kind of of living that our generation has taken for granted, but Mm -hmm. which is not so obviously available in the economy of the future. Mm-hmm. So if I hear what you're saying, you're say, suggesting that uh, that China has some very unfair advantages in the sense that they have uh, low-cost labor and they also uh, are able to get away with uh, cost to the environment uh, that the Western countries are not able to get away with and uh, that they are taking manufacturing jobs away essentially from the rest of the world, uh, those kind of jobs of which could provide middle-income uh, people with uh, sustenance, with a lifestyle that we have gotten used to. Have I summed up your argument? Yes. I mean, that has been the story for the past uh, couple of decades. And, and it's also a reason why we do not have uh, the kind of inflationary inflation that everybody has been predicting because uh-huh. there is no pressure on wages. Right. Everything can be done cheaper elsewhere. So wages here aren't rising. And this is why we're also seeing the... Uh, Diminishment of the middle class mm-hmm. as a significant uh, component of the uh, of the economy. Mm-hmm. Well, what does this have to do then, John? Uh, you mentioned also uh, that we are not seeing uh, capital formation uh, for mining industry. Uh, what's the connection area, or if, if there is one, between the, these sort of macroeconomic, global macroeconomic um, issues and? You know, clearly it's true that it's very difficult to raise capital in the sector that you and I are involved in, the mining sector. Well, economic growth is driven by uh, either some sort of technological windfall, uh, uh, industrial revolution, the Internet revolution, uh, um, technologies and processes which uh, enable one to produce more with a lot lot less. But the Mm -hmm. other way is to have a credit expansion. You lend money to people to consume now and pay later. And what's yeah. missing right now in this country is the sense that this is still a growing country. 
we have the sense that there is a light at the end of the tunnel that is shrinking, that we are mm-hmm. a dying nation, that everything is getting smaller. And if you have capital, you don't really want to lend to anybody. You don't want to develop business and expand for a, a market that doesn't have the means to consume. So we are caught in this paralysis. And, and that's why my earlier comment is the end of quantitative easing will suddenly tell everybody, okay, curl up and die, or get going and start investing in a future for this country. And with mm-hmm. that will come jobs, and as soon as there's job security, there will come loans, and it becomes a virtuous circle. Right now, we have the reverse vicious circle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a contracting circle, no question about it. Uh, but you got to get to the point, it seems to me, where the middle class has some disposable income to get to get uh, industry thinking about expanding again. How do you get there? Well, you, it, it's going to be tough, and uh, I know this is not a popular theme on, on your show, but uh, security of your, you know, your health care and so on mm-hmm. and, and, and your retirement, all these assumptions encourage people to spend now if those are if you can make a positive assumption in this regard. However, if we are heading into a world of, um, of austerity where we're going to cut back on services and, and throw people onto their own means in terms of uh, you know, taking care of their retirement or dealing with uh, escalating health care costs, uh, you are going to become a big saver. You are going to save your money and not invest it, not spend it. And it is this uh, growing fear that there is going to be nothing, at least at the state level, to take care of individuals down the road, which is further encouraging people to just, uh, you know, batten down the hatches and prepare Mm -hmm. for a worse future. Yeah, well, there's no question about it. And, uh, of course, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but it seems to me that the inflation rate that is... Uh, that has talked about the government, and I agree with you that it has not gotten out of hand like a lot of people thought it would with all this money creation, but that the inflation rate is probably somewhat higher than what the government claims it is. I don't know if you're in agreement with that. That's my my view, and that uh, if you really look at that, a higher inflation rate that, in fact, the middle class is worse off than the official statistics suggest. And so just for the mere purpose of survival, people are doing what you're saying they're doing. They're battening down the hatches. Yes, and, and the inflation, I mean, if, you, if, you, if you're the shopper in your household, you can see, uh, well, the stuff costs the same, but the bags are smaller. The amounts are yeah. smaller. <laughs> that 20-pound bag of briquettes is now really only 16 pounds of briquettes. Exactly. And, yeah. and now we're starting to see the prices creep upwards. But again, this is more of a, a slingshot catch-up effect. It, it is nowhere near the type of a systemic inflation that people fear will uh, you know become a runaway type situation we we just do not have the uh, wage pricing power to fuel that sort of inflation and mm-hmm. the governments are not really printing money and, and and distributing it to pay for stuff most of this money is going into buying buying back assets that have no value where the money was looted in the last decade and redistributed mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. that can't really have an inflationary effect. Now, if the banks started to lend aggressively at these low rates, then we could get an inflationary inflationary spiral going. But right mm-hmm. now, they are not prepared to do that. Mm-hmm. Well, I think you're right about that. And the, the money is sitting in the banks primarily, uh, and banks have been rewarded by given, uh, being given and paid for holding those reserves in the uh, in the banking system. Well, I'd like to get on to some of your ideas here. Uh, Nevada Exploration is a company you've talked to us about before on this show. Um, you, talk to us a little bit about Nevada Exploration because that's one of a sort of a company that I that I associate with you because of its uh, proprietary or at least its its new way of uh, exploring for for gold. Talk to us a little bit about, uh, for those who might not be familiar with this company, tell the story to our listeners again and, and where are they, how are they doing these days? You know, Nevada Exploration Inc. is, is an example of how uh, no matter how hard you work, how innovative you are, um, in this current market climate, uh, it, it's very difficult to succeed. Uh, They have spent the past 10 years developing a uh, method for looking under the gravel cover of Nevada uh, for anomalies in the groundwater that indicate the presence of a gold deposit. And Nevada has 
has produced over 250 million ounces of gold, and another 100 million are sitting there waiting to be developed, uh, mainly from the edges of the basins or, or from where, where the, uh, the, the ranges outcrop. But because mm-hmm. of Nevada's peculiar geology, half of it has been dropped down and filled with gravel, and the deposits were all put in before this happened. So conceivably, another 300 to 400 million ounces of gold are sitting there waiting to be found. And this company developed it all with a capital raised from investors, has collected over 5,000 samples, knows of several dozen hot spots under the gravel. Barrick has now figured out how to do it, is starting to do it. Barrick, I think, is going to end up becoming the, the most important uh, gold company in the world because it will eventually find the missing gold. And this is going to be a great thing for the United States because there will be another 300 million ounces in the ground that can be gradually mined over the decades. Now, I would prefer that my little junior, uh, in which I own a fair amount of shares and which is now trading at 3 to $0.04, cents, were the one to lead the charge in finding these deposits because you can imagine with a company that has a market cap of uh, $6 million, if you start finding five, ten million ounce gold deposits in Nevada, in the United States, the most secure jurisdiction in the world, the impact on the stock would be extraordinary. But the mm-hmm. market is so negative on the prospect of a junior finding anything that they are being starved to death from lack, lack of uh, capital inflows. No, it's uh, it's sad. It happens all too often in this industry, but uh, with this current market cap. So uh, so what are you saying about Nevada exploration to your subscribers? Are you saying uh, put a few dollars in there but don't go hog wild or what? Well, the, the normal cycle that happens with these types of stories at the end of a you know very long four or five-year bear market is that the company capitulates and does a rollback and then mm-hmm. – Powerful industry people come up and they refinance the company at a rock price and the old shareholders get squeezed down to 10% of the new company and the new companies who benefit from all the accumulated work done, they end up with 90% of the equity and all of the upside. That is the one scenario that faces the company. The other is that some large entity with deep pockets will end up becoming the sugar daddy for this junior and bankroll a major program to build the ultimate map of Nevada and perhaps even farm in and drill those targets that, that look the juiciest. If, if they can shift the funding responsibility to a deep-pocketed company, one that, say, has a whole bunch of royalty income or, or, or capital that they really don't know what to do with, then this company would flourish and would not need a rollback. Mm-hmm. Well, but if Barrick is already there, or if Barrick is already in Nevada, of course, are they are they um, uh, employing this technology there? So we, we believe we know that they have figured out the protocols for assaying gold, and gold is very, very low grade in in water. It, it's very mm-hmm. tricky to do it. But they have the gold rush deposit, which currently stands at 15 million ounces, is completely covered by gravel, and is rumored to be have grown into the 25 to 40 million ounce range, which we'll we'll Mm. probably find out next January. And I think when that comes out and is official, um, that's when we'll see Barrick start to take off. And they, of course, are a big company, which doesn't need any little company. So if they were smart, they would simply do a a hostile bid at uh, 10 cents, buy out uh, Nevada Exploration, Inc., take their database and start building from that. Instead, what they are doing is they're like an elephant plotting from one spot to another, slapping down claims in an area that might be prospective, doing the gold and groundwater sampling. If it kicks, they'll do the conventional data gathering and drill it. If not, they'll drop the claims and move on. And so they will, over the next five to ten years, plot from one spot to the next spot all the way through Nevada. And they'll get away with it because the mining industry is is so negative with regard to grassroots exploration that they really have no competition. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's uh, it's the way it is. It's um, uh, I mean, if you can, it, it, timing is everything in these things, uh, uh, John. And if you could uh, get a Nevada exploration or the right company at the right time, you can make a fortune in the juniors. But it's it's really difficult uh, to know for sure. A couple of other names I'd like to ask you about because we talked about you've talked about them before on the show. In Zinc Mining Limited. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And maybe you could tell our listeners about that company because I think it's. If, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's it's one of your favorites. 
Yeah, I mean, uh, the, of the um, eight or ten stocks that I really like, this one has been amongst the best performers, rising from six cents to currently eighteen twenty cents, and they own a, a not world class but a substantial zinc deposit in Utah, the most mining friendly state in the United States. And they've done a, a, a PEA, which suggests that uh, at 90 cents zinc, it is economic. And now zinc is at the dollar five dollar ten level, and there is a growing interest in zinc because it is a metal for which there are no significant uh, Western mines coming on stream. And everybody has always assumed that the Chinese will have an infinite supply of zinc, and whenever the price rises, they will just turn it on and pour more zinc into the market. But zinc's ability to expand it, uh, China's ability to expand its zinc supply, I think, is coming to an end. Uh, they have been depleting the low-hanging fruit, and they are starting to introduce uh, pollution controls, shutting down all these very nasty small-scale operations. And they are also trying to consolidate the zinc industry so that it becomes more efficient. China used to be an exporter of zinc. Now it's a major importer of zinc concentrates as it shifts from an infrastructure build-up economy to a consumer-oriented economy. This will require more zinc for appliances, for, for cars that are properly galvanized rather than having their undercarriage spray painted. So the demand is expected to rise for zinc even as global supply stagnates or possibly shrinks. So, so zinc is the one base metal where I can see a 50% upside move that is sustainable in the next three to four years. And in zinc is a well positioned for this. They're in the process of raising money for a $3 million drill program. They want to find the limits of the deposit before they do the feasibility study because they want to scale the study to the op, to, you know, to the maximum size of this deposit. Okay, and another one, uh, EMC was another favorite of yours. How does that look now? EMC has raised about 1.8 million, which puts it about two thirds towards the goal of raising three million that it needs to complete a feasibility study on its scandium deposit in New South Wales. I think this is the most exciting story out there. Hardly anybody knows about scandium, but the aluminum industry knows a lot about it. If you can bring a scalable supply of uh, scandium on stream, you transform the aluminum industry, uh, all the energy applications where they want lighter, stronger materials. They are, they, they, they are dying to have uh, scandium as the alloying input. Uh, the maximum you ever put into aluminum is 2%. Uh, uh, it has been a pipe dream or a holy grail for many decades to have scandium because the deposits that were known in the world were just too low grade. But in the last decade, substantially higher grade laterite deposits have been found in Australia's New South Wales, where it looks like we can scale production to from the current, you know, piddling 10 tons a year to 1,000 tons per year or more. This is a transformational metal, which will make the future uh, um, lighter, stronger, more efficient, and EMC is the most advanced in pushing a, one of these new deposits uh, towards a production decision. Well, as you can hear, uh, folks, John Kaiser has some very interesting ideas, uh, and I want to thank you, John. We're out of time already. Uh, so many more things I wanted to ask you about. A lot of companies that I cover in my newsletter, you also, I see, cover like East Main, Canamex, Probe Mines, Midas Gold, Gold Quest and others, and uh, so what, unfortunately the clock says we're out of time. So uh, I want to thank you very much, though, John, for being with me again and look to do it again sometime in the near future, hopefully. Yes, thank you, Jay, and as disclosure, I do own shares in Nevada Exploration, EMC, and Inzinc. 